Welcome back to the eSpecial Needs Podcast. I'm your host, Katherine Blanner. In season two of the eSpecial Needs Podcast, we'll be addressing care for the whole person, focusing on early intervention and school-based care resources. We've noticed that it can be difficult to find relevant and researched information for all stages of life, so our next season is focused on that. Here at eSpecial Needs, we want you to be able to not only get the products you need for your loved ones, but also help answer some of the questions that you might have along the way. Whether you're a parent, teacher, caregiver, therapist, or sibling, we want you to be able to help you get the information that you need while you're on the go. Today on the eSpecial Needs podcast, our guest is Pam Budke. She's the executive director of an organization called Champ Assistance Dogs, and she's going to talk to us today about therapy or service animals. Without further ado, welcome Pam. Hi, my name is Pam Budke. I'm the executive director for CHAMP Assistance Dogs. Um, CHAMP is an organization that actually trains and places service dogs with people with disabilities, children, adults, and veterans. Um, It costs CHAMP about $20,000 to train and place a service animal, an assistance dog, but we place them absolutely free of charge. That's amazing. How do you manage that? Um, It's primarily through fundraising. We are a nonprofit organization, so we write grants and we have donors, which most of our donors are individuals, but we also get some corporate sponsors, um, some foundations as well. Incredible. And how many dogs do you train like approximately per year? Um, Right now we have approximately 18 to 20 going through our program. Probably not every one of them will end up being an assistance animal, but um, usually about 20 at a time. Okay. Yes. And how do you how do you come to find the right kind of dogs for service animals or therapy dogs? Um, we actually, for our service animals, we are very fortunate because we do have quite a few breeders who actually donate dogs to us. But we also have started using some rescues in our assistance dog program. And it just comes from time. I think we look primarily at their temperament. Um, We're looking for a dog that's extremely calm. Um, We often use retrievers because um, working with someone with disability, they typically need a dog that will retrieve items, pick items up off the floor for them, and retrievers work really well. um, They also adjust very well to different owners and moving around frequently. Um, They're happy with anyone. They don't just have to stay with one person. Nice. That's really cool. So... Retrievers like golden retrievers or golden Labradors? retrievers, Labrador retrievers. Mm-hmm. We also have some mixes that are, you know, retriever mixes and some of the doodles, the doodles, because um, some of our clients have actually asked for a hyperallergenic dog or a dog that sheds less than others. We can't ever guarantee that because even sometimes the doodles will still shed quite a bit. So kind of let's talk about bigger scope things. So what are therapy dogs? Okay. Therapy dogs are actually dogs. um, We have a a team of therapy dogs that are owned by our volunteers. And therapy dogs actually visit people who are in nursing homes, hospitals, assisted living centers, um, homeless shelters. We do the USO. We do the veterans home. Um, We also visit people like students during finals because they're stressed and the dog can help lower blood pressure and make them feel calmer. Um, Our volunteers, if they're interested in their dog becoming a therapy dog, they can call us and we actually set up an evaluation before they can enter our class. We look first at their skills. They have to have some skills like sit down, stay, come. Um, And then if they pass the skills portion of the test, we will evaluate their temperament. They have to get along well with other dogs. They have to get along well with people. And they can't really be reactive to sounds or noises, things like that. Um, If they pass the temperament test, then we have a 12-week class that will certify them as a therapy dog. And we visit about 100 places at least per month. And we can, they can go visit the, the places that we have a contract with. 
That's amazing. So when you start training them, do you have like another dog that works with the therapy dog or how does it work? Well, when we are training them, they'll come to our class for 12 weeks, but when we're evaluating them, we will have a dog there to see how they react to other dogs and okay. we'll, you know, kind of pass them off to several people and see if they're okay with that, you know, or if they're reactive or shy. We don't really want a dog that's shy. We want a dog that's going to want to walk up to people and comfort them. And it's amazing because the dogs can really tell when someone needs that visit. And often it's the people that are kind of isolated in a nursing home um, who don't really relate well or talk much to other people, our dogs tend to kind of gravitate towards those people. They tend to know that that person needs that comfort. And sometimes people who haven't spoken in weeks will talk to a dog. That's it's so just cute. amazing. Yeah. yeah. So is there any breed that works better as kind of a therapy dog? We have all breeds, all sizes. And um it, it's great because some people react or like the smaller dogs. They like to hold them in their laps in the nursing homes, and other dogs really like the taller dogs. So we have a variety, all kinds, all breeds. Wow. That's super neat. So let's talk about the other side of it. So service dogs. Assistance dogs. dogs yes. uh -huh. Assistance dogs. Okay. Which is, what's the proper term? It, well, assistance dogs come, covers a broader base. In the assistance dogs, we have service dogs that help people with disabilities. We also have facility dogs who actually work with a professional caregiver in a facility like a hospital, a courthouse, a child advocacy center, something like that. So we train both and they both have the same skill set. Um, it just depends on, we kind of look at the dog's personality and the job they're going to do and then we choose the best dog for the person. And that also is chosen by um, how they bond with that person. Sometimes when we're going to place a service dog with someone with a disability, we will take several dogs in there and see which dog and which person bond the best before we make a decision. What kind of disabilities or special needs do these dogs work with? Okay, I think most service dog organizations have their own specialty and we primarily work with people with physical disabilities, mobility issues, and some cognitive disabilities as well. So our dogs will do things like open doors, um, pick up items that are dropped. They can open a refrigerator and get a lunch out of there or medication and bring it to someone who's in a bed. They can help someone in a bed turnover. <laughs> um, they can help remove clothing. Wow. Um, there's just a lot of different things. We have dogs also for balance um, that will wear a harness for someone who needs, you know, to be able to like you know, hold on to something just to get their balance. Um, the dog will wear a harness the whole time they're working. So, I mean, there's just a bunch of different things that we can do. Do you have dogs that are that work with individuals with epilepsy or seizure disorders? We don't. Okay. I mean, we have dogs that work with someone who has a physical disability and also may have that. And sometimes instinctively, the dog will learn to let that person know, to notify that person. But there are organizations that train just for that. Okay. That's the, the whole world of it is just like insanely cool to me. It is. It <laughs> it's is. so neat. And, it's, and, and all of us specialize in certain things. So mm -hmm. that's just our specialty. Yeah, truly man's best friend. So when you train service dogs, mm -hmm. what's kind of, what are the steps for that? Um, it's a long process. It actually takes us approximately two years to train a service dog. When we get the puppies, we usually get them around eight weeks of age and we immediately have a vest on them. We're taking them out to restaurants, public transportation, so all sorts of places. And they learn very quickly to just lie quietly under the table at a restaurant. Um, when our dogs, and our dogs never live in a kennel, and we just serve the local community, mm -hmm. um, our dogs immediately will go to a puppy raiser that teaches them house manners and works with them out in the community. Then when they become about 16 weeks of age, we actually have a partnership through the um, Department of Corrections at a women's prison in Vandalia, Missouri. And our dogs will go up to the prison and work with the ladies there. And they work for CHAMP, they train our dogs. They'll stay up there about six or eight weeks and then they come out for six or eight weeks because when the ladies are training them, they can't socialize them. So that happens when they come out and go back to their puppy raiser and that's when they get out and about in the community. So for that whole two years, they're rotating in and out of the prison. So and <laughs> it is incredible what it does for the ladies in the prison. I mean, most of them are in there um, 
it has to do with abuse. And sometimes that relationship with the dog is the first, first positive relationship they've ever had. Wow. And it makes an incredible difference for them. Yeah, and it's probably like a great symbiotic relationship for your, your organization as well. Yes, it is. Because you get trained dogs. It and is. I guess, are they working on a volunteer basis or are they employed? No, they are they employed. Work? Yeah. Okay. So everybody in the prison has a job doing something. Oh. And um, they can kind of choose their jobs. Of course, we're very particular about who we have training our dogs. Mm -hmm. And they can't have any um, abuse, animal abuse, or child abuse in their background to work with us. So, um, and we also require that they have at least a GED to come into our program. So, some of the women who really want to do it, they don't have the GED. They will work to get that to get into our program. And so we cool. actually have hired two ladies who have gotten out of prison. One has been with us over 10 years, and the other one's been there like eight years, and they're fabulous, fabulous employees. And some of them come out and volunteer with us later. So it's it's a wonderful program. Yeah, that's like amazing because it sounds like it's so fruitful and like life giving it is. in a lot of different ways, not yes. just for what you're trying to do as an organization, but also for people who not only benefit from these dogs, but people who are training them. That's Amazing. And what's cool is usually after the dogs are placed, we'll have our clients, after they bond with their service dog, we'll have them come up to the prison and actually meet the women who train them. Wow. And that makes a huge difference for them because sometimes it's hard for them to let that dog go to someone because they've been with them two years. But once they see what they've done and how they're able to give back from the prison, it makes all the difference. And it's usually a tearful exchange between both parties. It's, right. It's very I cool. can only imagine. So yeah. yeah, I guess your your families that benefit from these dogs are probably just that's so cool. Wow. I'm yeah. just kind of dumbfounded. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I don't have any other words. That's neat. Yes, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. So what should parents, caregivers and schools and individuals benefiting from the animals know before beforehand, before they come in contact? Like say, okay. for example, like a kid is on a li like a list. Are they on a list or how does this They work? are on okay. a waiting list. It's usually about two years to be quite honest because it takes us that long to train a dog. So what should they know going into that? Um, well, I think first of all, they need to know a little bit about the care of the animal um, and how to actually teach, not teach the skills, but actually have the dog perform those skills. And what we actually do about six months before placement, since we are local and we work with our clients, we will go in and start working with them on how to, how to give the commands um, about grooming, about working with the dog, everything they need to know. We'll do that prior to them getting that dog. And then once they get the dog, at first they just have them overnight, then they have them a weekend, and we're there constantly. Even after the dog's been placed for years, we visit them at least once or twice a year, and we're always on call. If they need us, we just come in. But something, you know, and kids are usually the best at this, but if you see a service dog, people always ask me, why can't I pet a service animal? Well, for instance, I talked about someone using a dog for balance. If that dog is there for them on balance and they're walking across a parking lot and you come up and distract the dog, it could move the wrong way and that person could fall. Or if they're trying to detect like a dog that is a seizure detection dog, if you disturb them, they may miss a cue. So you always want to talk to the person. You can ask them, can I pet your dog? But don't be upset if they say no, because the dog is working and that's his job. For individuals with autism or other special needs that are prone to elopement or have difficulty remaining seated, it may be beneficial to keep your loved ones safe in the car. This is where the easy on adjustable vest for vehicles might come in handy. It is used to transport individuals of all sizes and ages, keeping them in a secure, comfortable, and upright position. It is dynamically tested and meets federal motor vehicle safety standards. Easy on vests are a great way to ensure the safety of all passengers. The vests are relatively affordable and easy to install and can be customized to best fit the user. For a limited time, take 5% off Easy on Vests with the offer code PDCST. It's like podcast without the vowels. To find out what Easy on Vests might be right for you, go to eSpecialNeeds.com. Always consult a physician or therapist before purchasing. How can schools 
if you are able to speak to this, how can schools kind of prepare to have a service or therapy animal? Most schools, the colleges and universities, we place dogs with people who are 18 or older for public access, meaning they can be anywhere in the community. With children, we typically just place home service dogs. Okay. Um, a child with a disability, we feel it's hard enough for them to get you know, through the community and be able to handle their disability and everything else that they need to take care of, it would be very hard for them to control a dog as well. But at home, we definitely place them with very young children all the way up to high school. Um, but, I, you know, I think anywhere the, the school needs to be prepared if they do have a service animal there to talk to the other students about how you don't want to talk to the dog, if the dog's working and just tell them all those things so they're aware of it. Um, and we do that when we place a facility dog, um, the same thing, they can't really interact with other people at first when they go into a facility, like if they're gonna work in a courthouse. So we will talk to all the staff too. When this dog first comes in, you have to ignore him, you can't pet him because he needs to bond with his handler. Once that happens in a facility, then other people can visit with them. Mm -hmm. But we try to make everyone aware of the fact that they need to kind of ignore the dog at first. You kind of talked about this when I first met you. You kind of talked about how you guys supply courtroom dogs? Yes. Okay, can you go into that a little bit sure. more? Sure. We have courthouse facility dogs, and what they actually do, they're often in a deposition for a child who's been sexually abused, usually. Um, sometimes they have witnessed a crime, and they have to go through a deposition with a court reporter and sometimes one or two attorneys. It's very difficult for that child. I mean, their parents aren't in there with them. They're in there on their own to tell what happened to them and they have to go into you know detail. So um, what we actually do is have the courthouse dog that can actually sit on a sofa with them, right next to them. And when we ask them about, or when the attorney asks about their abuse, they'll often talk to the dog and lay on the dog and they're able to find their voice and tell their story. Some dogs, as long as the judge is willing to allow the dog in the courthouse, the dog can go behind the witness stand with that mm -hmm. child when he's sitting across from his abuser in court and that makes all the difference right. for them. Because I know? mean, I'm sure that's like extremely calming. Uh, yeah, and it's just so stressful to I know. You know, be I... face to face with an yeah, abuser. Yeah, because you also have to like, you have to not only yeah, be face to face with the person, but recall right. what happened to you. Right. What are some proactive boundaries that can be set with a therapy or service animal? Um, I think the, the main thing is just what I mentioned is always ask someone. And when you see someone with a ther or service dog, go up to them and talk to the person. You don't want to ignore the person. You want to talk to them. Don't even look at the animal. Don't make eye contact with them. Nothing. Unless you ask the person and the person says, the handler can say, yes, you may pet my dog. I think that's the most important thing. Again, anytime you see a dog with a vest on, um, that's a working animal and you shouldn't touch them unless you have permission. So whether it's a therapy dog or whether it's a service dog or a courthouse dog, you should always ask before touching. So take me through kind of shifting gears here. So take me through kind of how a parent would get set up with your organization okay. or of family. Um, you can go on our website, which is champdogs.org, and you can get our phone number or you can apply on through our website. Just tell us that you're interested in a service dog. You can call us um, and we will talk with you and find out. First of all, you have to live locally because we only serve the local community. Mm -hmm. um, and and then, we're based in St. Louis. Yes, we're based yes, in, St. in Southern, Southern Illinois. Will okay. serve as well, um, and then we will set up. If we think we can serve you and make a difference in your life, we find out first what you want your dog to do for you or for your child. We will set up a time to come and visit in the home, um, meet the child, meet the parents, make sure that everyone in the family is on board and they all want the service animal. Um, and then eventually, you know, if we think we can serve you, you will become what we call a student. And six months before placement, we'll be in there with you working constantly on how to learn, you know, the skills and how to work with a dog. And we will not place that dog unless you're absolutely ready. If you've got the dog two years and say your child's health deteriorates and the dog needs to learn some new skills to better serve them, all you have to do is pick up a phone and say, 
you know, can you help us? We need our dog to do this skill. And we'll go in there and work with you in your home, in your community, at work, whatever, um, until that dog's skill is solid. And that's the advantage of only serving the local community because we're there for the life of the partnership. And people always ask me, what happens when a dog passes away? Yeah, that's my next um, question. <laughs> if you need another service dog, um, you will go to the top of our list and we will you know, get you a successor dog. Mm -hmm. What also, in the case of like people who either don't need a service animal anymore or if the individual that was benefiting from this therapy dog passes away, okay. what happens in those cases? Okay. We do maintain ownership of the dogs through um, the life of the partnership until that dog retires. And then we will let the person adopt them if they want to. If they don't want to adopt them, the dog comes back to us. If um, So, you know, that's an individual. Some dogs at 10 years of age don't want to work anymore. I mean, okay. they're they're arthritic or whatever. Some are 12 years. It's really up to the dog. But if the family doesn't want the dog, then it comes back to us. If someone passes away and the parents of a child or whomever would like to adopt the dog, that will definitely, we will definitely do that. Um, we always look at the welfare of the animal. And if they're used to living with a family, the worst thing we could do would be take the animal away from that family. Do you have kind of a vetting process for people getting set up for your organization? Um, yeah, we do. Um, we, we will first send out an application for you to fill out. Um, and then we will also ask you, you know, why do you need a service animal? Like if you have disabilities, you will have to have a doctor fill out a, a form too, saying that they think a service animal would help be a benefit to you. And then that's when we start the process of coming in to meet with you in your home and finding out where the dog will live and will he sleep in the bedroom? Will he do this? Will he do that? And, and that's kind of the process that we go through. So talking about kind of just therapy dogs in general, mm -hmm. right? So what what set of skills does a therapy dog like kind of cover? Okay, the ones that go into hospitals and mm -hmm. nursing homes, there's not a lot of skills, quite honestly. They have to be um, pretty rock solid and they're not going to be reactive. Say if we're in a hospital and someone drops a tray of food, they're not going to start barking. If someone comes in and is dressed differently with a big hat, they're not, they're not going to be reactive to that. They have to be very friendly and want to be petted. Um, and that's mainly what we're there for. We're there to comfort people and lower blood pressure, give them all the health benefits that a therapy dog can do. And it mainly is just a well-behaved dog that is going to be affectionate and calm and do pretty much what the people want them to do. Now, we do have a tricks class for our therapy dogs that they can go to. And that works really well because we do sometimes go into like transplant units of a hospital and the people are in isolation. So the dog can't actually go in the room. And some of those people are in the hospital for like a year waiting for a transplant so we'll stand outside the room and the dog can do tricks and the people oh, can see them which is wonderful that's so cute and, and it works well not only for the patients but for the families who are visiting the patient too you know yeah. so it makes all the difference so be for everybody yeah yeah um, and then we do reading with kids too we go to libraries and schools and do that as well so the dogs have to be very calm for that yeah how do you how do you teach that how does that get taught? That's part, some of that can't be taught. It's that's some nature. of that's a temperament. Okay. And that's kind of what we look at. You know, we teach them skills and we work with them on different things, you know, to be calm. But, you know, they either have that temperament or they don't. How do you even determine that? Like when they're puppies, I guess you just hold them and you're like. Yeah, when they're puppies, you, you can't always tell. And that's why like a third of our animals that we get for service dogs don't always make it. We have a waiting list of people who want to adopt the dogs that don't make it completely. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, and a lot of our therapy dog people will adopt them. Um, but, you know, you can't always tell when they're a puppy. It's usually when they're adults that you can really tell. And that's why some dogs will make it 15 months and all of a sudden they start becoming reactive to something. Oh, okay. So, yeah. That's interesting. So it's, you, it's just temperament then? It is temperament, wow. primarily. Yeah. And when they're a baby... Um, that's why we get them so young, because they're very impressionable between the ages of six weeks to like 
14 weeks, that is the best time to get them out and about in the community. And that's why when they're eight weeks of age, we've got the vest on them and we've got them everywhere we can take them, getting them used to noises, sounds, everyone holding them, feeding them treats. Um, so we get them out and about right away. So again, shifting gears a little bit more, um, tell me kind of why, why you're passionate about your work. Okay. Um, I think it's mainly, I mean, people think that we are an animal organization and we actually, we're a human service organization. We help people, but we do it through animals. And I personally have a daughter with disabilities and I know what a, what an animal, what a dog can do for them. Um, it's just so rewarding to see the life changes in someone with a disability and how that dog can give them self-confidence and freedom. Um, it's just amazing. Like in the matter of one year after they get their dog until a year later, just the difference in that person is amazing. Yeah. Did your daughter have a service animal? Or? She does not, but okay. she, we have three mm -hmm. that live with us, and then we always have an extra dog at home that is going through training. So you have to so, take your work home with you. Yes, we do. <laughs> yeah, homework. it's a real oh, disadvantage, actually. No, <laughs> I love it. So yeah, it's perfect. So does everyone that is employed by Champ kind of like do they take some of the service? Most animals? of us, okay. not all of us, but yeah, most so, of us do. Wow, that's interesting. So you said yeah. that also there's people that have. Who then who takes the other ones, I guess? Okay, puppy, we have puppy raisers and we are always looking for puppy raisers. Wow. People who will take the dogs um, when they're eight weeks of age, start the house training. You don't really teach a lot of skills, but when and then know that when they're 16 weeks of age, they'll go to prison for the first time. They'll be gone six or eight weeks, come back, and then they stay with you six or eight weeks. That continues through two years of their life. Wow. And then they do go to someone else. You have to, to know that and be willing to let go of that animal. But it's so rewarding. And I can only we are imagine. always looking for puppy raisers. You can call us and, okay. and talk to us <laughs> about that. So, yeah. That's and awesome. some people are able to take the dogs to work with them. You know, that's an ideal puppy raiser mm -hmm. if they have a job like that. That's pretty good. Um, so for people that have an animal that they want, can, can like... So, like, say somebody has a dog mm -hmm. and they're like, oh, I want my dog to go to therapy dog training. I think they'd be good at it. Is that a thing they can do? Yes. Okay. All they have to do is call us, set up the evaluation, come in for the evaluation prior to our class. Um, the classes are 12 weeks. If you pass the um, skills and the evaluation, the temperament evaluation, you can start going to our class. And we have it, you know, in our office. There's a back part of our office, which is our training center. So, yes. That's cool. <laughs> so we have classes all year long. And we have not only therapy dog, but we also have obedience classes. Like if your dog doesn't have skills, sit down, stay. You can go to obedience class first and then sign up for the therapy dog class. Cool. So, yes. Can you tell me a, like, good success story example? Sure. And I, I just talked a little bit about a balanced dog, but we have a student who actually got her service dog at 17, which is a little earlier than we normally place them. They were 18. They're usually 18 and she needed a dog that she couldn't walk well on surfaces, anything that was uneven. Um, she got her service dog in um, her senior year. She had never been able to participate in a field day ever at school without holding on to someone or whatever. So she got her service dog with, she went to field day, was able to participate. She felt great about that. And then she, graduation was shortly after that. And she was never really able to carry anything up and down steps. So when she graduated, she was able to go up the steps with wit on the stage. She received her diploma. She gave it to Wit. Wit carried her diploma and they went down the steps. <laughs> so and now amazing. she's in college. She's oh going to Wash U. So the That's dog amazing. has made a huge difference for her. That's yeah. amazing. And I think self-esteem is a big part of it too because she's so much more confident when Wit's by her side and she can do these things. Right. So much independence that you get. Yeah, yeah. It is independence. Yes. And I mean, self-confidence is definitely a thing from that. And then in your early 20s as well. Right. Or your late teens, early 20s. And it's she like stays in the dorm and he's with her and it's wonderful. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. Okay. So wrapping up, like, are there any questions that I should have asked but didn't? 
I don't think so. I think you okay. were very thorough and you covered everything. Um, if anyone is interested in um, CHAMP and you'd like to call us, our number is 485-1264. We'd be happy to speak with you about any questions you may have. All right. Thank you so much for coming All on. All right. Thank you lovely. so much, Catherine. This podcast is hosted and produced by Katherine Blanner with the help of Jason Hinglin Lauderdale. If you liked this podcast, leave us a rating on Apple Podcasts, follow us on Spotify, and share it with your friends. If you want to keep up with us, you can follow eSpecial Needs on social media. On Facebook, we're just eSpecial Needs. On Instagram, at eSpecial underscore Needs. And Twitter, at eSpecial Needs. Thank you again for listening, and don't forget, you're doing great things. <laughs>